So, let's try to, uh, one of you came to me during the break and said, uh, this is very complicated and difficult to do. And, uh, and to find, you know, the, the, the balance in time and going on and all these ministries that are on different angles. And I will not deny that. It is difficult. But you can make the concept of sustainable development very operational if you do it in the way I, I uh, just explained with the capitals and so on. And talk to people about ambitions. But it is absolutely necessary that you bring around the table not only politicians and civil servants, but also citizens and also people from business, because they talk different language. And that helps the other people to, to focus on what is really the problem. I just asked these three wonderful ladies from Slovenia, please give us uh, a short, uh, in a few points, uh, uh, a summary of what you, what you picked up before the intermission. to negotiate, we know how to how negotiate, to negotiate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and we um, <clears throat> kind of address the meaning of sustainable development, what it is, so we want to use the current resources, but in a way that it stays for the future generations. I think that, yes, the most important thing is to communicate with each other and to, you know, just to uh, take off this mask we are wearing parties. Yeah. To take uh, into account that there are different cultures in the world and uh, we just we must uh, to adopt, you know, the ideas. Yeah. To gain win win solution. Yeah. Yeah. Could you all hear that? What I'm going to what I told you until now, what I'm going to tell you with in the next half hour is something that I since I have retired as CEO of the largest nature conservation organization in the Netherlands, I, I do a lot of what is called policy mediation. Very, you know, in the Netherlands is a very, very densely populated area and there's always a, a disagreement about the future of certain areas. And those disagreements sometimes go very deep and last very long. There's areas where... Uh, there's been a fight between, uh, between organizations and citizens for more than 20 years. And, uh, and uh, for example, what kind of farming is, should we do here? Is, should we have more water here? What about adding nature reserves? What is the future of the people who live here? Can they actually expand their houses and so on? You can recognize those kind of discussions. And people hate each other and they don't listen to each other and they uh, write in the papers and they ask questions in Parliament. And then um, I'm, I'm sometimes asked to, can, can you do something? And what I do is I tell them the story that I tell you. I tell them that there is a new concept that can help them overcome the problems of today. Because we should focus not on what we have as problems today, but we should focus on the future of our children. You should be amazed, but if you talk about the future of a farmer, you talk to a farmer about his future, you get a very different answer than when you ask what the future of his children are. Is. So if I can convince such a person in this context about talking about the future of the children, we get an opening about, about finding consensus which is very different from what he thought until then. I do this regularly. And what I also do is that what that's no time for this in the summer school. I teach it in the American way, and that means that uh, after some introduction, we do a simulation, role playing. And with the real people, the real people who fight, the real civil servants, the, the mayor, the regional ministers, the, and so on, the farmer, you, the farmers' leaders, the nature conservation organizations, the water boards, I make them do simulation. We play roles. And we solve comparable problems, not our own problems, but problems of other people, and we play that role. And then, in the context of this, what I tell you now, the next day, they are able to solve a problem that they hadn't been solved in 20 years. And that's how you can make sustainable development operational. It's incredible. When I started this about four years ago, I thought, because then I retired, I thought, 
Let's see what happens. Until now, we had no failures. No failures. Every time we made the concept of sustainable development operational as in a negotiating atmosphere and concept, people were willing and able to solve the problem. Isn't that amazing? Yeah? Yes, so we have... We have uh, I've learned this, you know, I did, did not invent this. This is not theory. This is based on 30 years of study by the program on negotiation of Harvard, MIT, and Tufts University. That's, uh, that's called PON. If you Google, Google PON, program on negotiation, you will find not only theory, but you will also find the simulations. You can simply, by uh, maybe pay, paying $50 or so, you can find in English simulations that you can use in, the, in your class, in your day-to-day -day life. They are developed to do this kind of work. They are not all about uh, sustainable development, but there are several about sustainable development. And I learned it there. Since 1980, I cooperate with this school. Because I was responsible for the development of, of, of environmental policy in the Netherlands. I was the highest civil servant. I had to help my ministers developing policies. I sat at the tables in Brussels. I, I had to talk to the German minister and the French minister. I had to speak all these languages because they didn't speak English. I had to negotiate in French, which is very difficult for me, I tell you. So I went to classes every evening to Berlitz to, with my dossiers. And I talked to the teacher, the dossiers we had in Brussels in French. Because the French minister was a, a very good minister, but she was a lady who spoke only French. So I had to do this. My minister didn't speak French, so I had to do it. And so we found out that we were, at the time, in the 80s, we were small and not powerful. Environmental movement was not very powerful. So we had to overcome the fact that we were not a very influential ministry. We simply had to be better. If you're not strong, you have to be better. That's what we did. So we cooperated with, with the universities in the United States, and they explained to us how they had studied all negotiations that came on their table for 30 years. International organization, uh, negotiations, local uh, national, uh, uh, negotiations, every kind. And they pulled from there by studying it. They saw what were the concepts that were successful and what was not successful. What was the reasons there was a success and why not. And what I tell you is based on that. It's experience. So I tell you experience. I did not invent this. There's hundreds and hundreds of books about this. If you, want, if you want to really be good in your job on this, what I tell you now, and mutual gains approach, which was called win-win negotiations in the past, there's a book that's called The Consensus Building Handbook. It's this thick. It costs $175. But everything is in there. It's amazing. Sometimes I get stuck. I, I sit in, and I, I, I have these people around, you know, and, they're, oh, and I think, oh, God, how do I get further? Because I'm tired then, and I take the book. <laughs> look at a certain phase, because all the phases are described, and I look at it, and I, oh yeah, of course, I forgot that. Okay, do this, and it worked. It's amazing. Okay, now, mutual gains, which means win-win, but we don't say win-win anymore, because so many people think you cannot have win-win. If you win, and he wins, that's called a draw. So, it's not win-win anymore, we call it mutual gains. Mutual gains, which means both parties on both sides get better from it. Mutual. They, get, they, they gain. The f I, I go through this qu very quickly. There's five key principles. Know your BATNA, focus on interest, not positions, invent options for mutual gains, use objective criteria, build relationships along with agreement. Simple, huh? Eh? It's simple. First, um, what you try to do is reach consensus. Consensus is very different from compromise. What is a compromise? What is a compromise? That's always the result of political negotiations is a compromise. What is a compromise? What? Something up. Exactly. So we both, both parties give something up. But we really want, but we think we cannot achieve it. That's a compromise. So, what is the general feeling when there is a compromise? What, how do the people leave the room? How do they feel? 
They feel a like, bit like losers. Yeah. Except when you're a very experienced politician, you know that you have to show a happy face because you say, yeah, this is all I can get. Eh? That's all I can get. Compromise is that you start, it, the compromise is always the result from what I just told you about the traditional method. Uh, five years ago, there were elections in the Netherlands and uh, two parties won, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, and um, they were asked to come to the television and to explain, and they said, yeah, yeah, we have now to negotiate. And uh, both said, yeah, we will probably have to give in. Yeah, we have to give in. Because our plans, our, our, our plans we have, now that we have, to, we, are, we have to do it together, we have to find compromises. We have to give in. That was the first thing they said. And of course, those negotiations failed. Because if you start from this traditional method, we get together, and I, I try to avoid to give in, as, or to give up as much as, 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 least, as least as possible. I try to avoid giving in much, but I have to give in. You have a ne negative attitude. You're not one, let's, let's, see, let's see what I can get. Let's see what I can get. Now use it. Do you understand? So, so You have some small things written here that I can use them and write it in big. Consensus is the other word. Compromise and consensus. Consensus is, does it mean that everybody agrees? Everybody? No. I, luckily enough, many people say no. no. Well, if you look in Webster's Dictionary, it says, it says it is a general agreement. General agreement. And the second thing they say is the judgment that there is agreement, that there is general So there is general agreement. That's not something that you can uh, decide on your own. People sit together and they have to decide that there is general agreement. That's a judgment. The judgment that there is a general agreement have to be, has to come from most parties concerned. Most parties. Do we have agreement? The chairman asks, do we have agreement? Do we have agreement? And then you are yes, 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 yes. And some say uh, no, and so on. And you go. But general agreement, there is general agreement. Most of the people concerned say there is general agreement. That's consensus. But there's one thing very, but what you should add there as well. There is something, and that relates to one of the things I already showed. There is, at the end of the meeting, once there is reached the judgment that there is general agreement, there is solidarity and belief. So the whole group has this feeling we should stick together. Then you have consensus. This is what we really want. I, we, uh, not so long ago, I had an agreement, an agreement with a farmer's organization, and uh, it was difficult. And uh, they had to go back to their uh, constituency and they had to explain. And I said, what will you please tell us now in this group? When you go back to your bosses, to, you are the negotiators, you go back to your board. What will you tell them? And they said, we will tell them that they don't change one word because we are proud of what we have, have here. That's the attitude of consensus. Don't change it because we are proud, we are proud on what, on the result, of the result. Okay? So that's what you try to achieve, consensus. Sometimes they say the Netherlands is a consensus democracy. That's not true. We are the sublime compromise democracy. We always come up with solutions that actually nobody wants. I remember this is the story about the Ministry of, of Agriculture. The Ministry of Agriculture was responsible for agriculture and for nature conservation. And they came up with some uh, legislation, and the farmers were very angry, and the nature conservation organizations were very angry. And what did the minister say? We must have done right because everybody is angry. We are just in the middle. Which is one of the stupidest things I ever heard in my life, and the person was really not stupid. I mean, but they really thought that if everybody is angry, then it's okay. 
Of course, such legislation doesn't exist long. It didn't even it didn't come to parliament, through Parliament. It was killed in Parliament. Now, if we want to reach, in the mutual gains approach, we want to reach consensus, then the first thing is BATNA. BATNA. What is BATNA? It says that it's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. If you want to go to an international environmental negotiation and you have to think about what do we want to achieve, what do we want to achieve, you have to know what is your position or if you don't go. Suppose we don't go to the negotiation, what can we do? So in the beginning of the European communities, we in the Netherlands, we had very advanced uh, uh, environmental legislation and we simply didn't go to meetings in Brussels because we said if the EU, EU takes over, then our legislation will be watered down. So our present situation is much better than the result of any negotiation. Our present result is much better, so we don't go. Then you know what your BATNA is. Your BATNA is to keep what we have. So if you, what do you think? If somebody has a very strong BATNA, how do you go to a negotiation? What's your feeling? Huh? Yeah? But how do you feel? I mean, are you nervous? Of course not, you're very relaxed. You go there because maybe they have something for me and they don't have anything for me, it's fine. I'm happy anyway. So what you try to do is, what is my BATNA? And very often environmental organizations, NGOs say, our BATNA is we go to court. If there's no result from the negotiation, we go to court. We take you to court, see you in court. Is that a BATNA? Is that a good BATNA? It's a BATNA, but it's a good BATNA? Hmm? Why not? Well, can somebody react to that? Is it, always, is it always better to go to, to talk than to go to court? Exactly. So, what if you, so if you go to court, your influence about on, the, on the result is minimal because there's a judge who will decide. And what do you know in advance? So, a good partner is going to court and knowing what the outcome will be. So, in Europe now, we have what's called the Birds and Habitat Directive, and we have Natura 2000 Directive, and there's a very explicit legislation about what you can do in those areas and what you cannot do in those areas, with very specific procedural requirements. Local communities and regional communities always do this wrong. So in the Netherlands, you know, if it is in a Tour 2000 area or it is in a Bird and Habitat Directive area and they want to build uh, houses there or if they want to create a road or whatever, you sit at the table very relaxed because you know if you go to court, you win anyway. You win anyway. I remember, I remember a situation where the provincial government of North of Holland wanted to create in, in, in a natural reserve a dump site for uh, harbor waste, you know, uh, sludge. Huge dump site. So I called this uh, uh, provincial minister and I said to her, uh, can I please come? Uh, I represented uh, a huge nature conservation organization, more than a million, almost a million members. So I said, can we talk? So she said, yes. So I went there, she had to sit with her staff, I had one of my staff. And I said, I would really like to talk to you about alternatives, about what we could do instead of making this. She said, oh, no, no, I don't want to talk about alternatives. Because we did all our research, we had a lot of engineering firms looking at it, that this is the best solution. And I said, uh, yes, but you know, we, this not, we don't want that. And we think there are better solutions. No, I don't want to discuss this. We have done all our homework. We have studied it for two years. We have all these independent reports. This is the best solution. So I said, I'm very sorry that you don't want to discuss alternatives. I'm really sorry. Because I can tell you that dump site will not happen. It will not be built. And we left. You know what she said to us? They went and they went to the next door. And of course, I know all these people. So, so, so she went with her staff. She went to the room next door. What do you think she said to her staff?
What did she say to her staff after this meeting? She said, how arrogant can a person be? This Everest is very arrogant. What should she have said? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, but, but what, should, what should she have said to her staff? Please inform me why he is so sure that it will not happen. Because I showed, I showed a very strong Batna feeling. And she didn't want to know. She thought that that was arrogance. And really, eight weeks later, the parliament killed the project. That's about Batna. Improve your Batna. Don't, so improve. Say to try to, you know, very often if you go to negotiation, you don't know what your Batna is. And then you're actually weak negotiator. You should know what you can get outside the negotiation. And if it's weak, try to improve it. And don't say that you have it. Don't say you have it. Don't talk about it immediately. Use it when the time is there. A wonderful example is you really, you studied law at Ljubljana University. You're the best student and you want to go to the best law firm in Ljubljana. It's really where you want to work. But you know they, pay, they, don't, they don't pay very well. Because the best law firms pay the young people very poorly all over the world. Because they say, you still have to learn, you know. So what do you do? This is what they learn on all American law schools. What, they, what you do is, you, try, you, you apply for a job in that firm you want to work for, but you also apply for a job in a firm which is not so important. And you make sure that you are accepted by this other firm. So you, they say, we are so happy that the best student of Ljubljana University would like to work for us. We are so happy we give you a big salary. You say, okay, this is, this is what I get. You say, let me think about it. And you go back to the first one. And they say, you know, we, we really would like to have you. You know, we really like to have the number one student. But, you know, we, you, we pay only this. And you say, you know, I can really cannot afford this. You know, I have to raise a family. I cannot afford this. And this is the kind of money I get from another company. So you please, uh, uh, you, you, if you really want to have me, this is what I can get in another firm. That's your batna. Uh, you understand? That's my batna. I created a batna before I went into the... Life can be so simple. This is, I must say, the, 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 this is typically North American kind of negotiation. And then, of course, should understand what the batnas of other people are. If they can do, you know, if you negotiate with the ministry... And they just, just negotiate because of you because they want to be nice and looking nice in the papers, but really they can decide themselves. They don't even need you. If you know that, you're not Mr. Big Mouse. You try to achieve as much as you can in the negotiations because you know they have a very strong button. And it says help them reality check. It means if they think that they have a strong button, Make them think about it if they're as strong as, you, as they really think. Make them doubt their own Batna. It's not a dirty trick, it's part of the, of the game. So here it's again. If you have a good Batna, you know, I don't have to give in all the time. Now, the second one is focus on interest and not position. Position is, I don't want that. No, I don't want that, no. Interest is, I can explain you why I'm against it. I can explain you. I can tell you my interest. So interest is about why you have certain positions. Yeah? And people always think that if you tell why you, why you are against it, or why you're in favor of it, that you make your position that you are weak, which is absolutely not the case. Please explain why you think this is a good idea or this is not a good idea. Explain as much as you can, because people then sometimes say, most often say, oh, is that what is worrying about? You? What is worrying you? Oh, if that is the case, then remember the orange. Okay. So this is what you can do. If this is the, uh, if we want to re reach an agreement about the emissions in the water of a certain factory, 
if you work for the factory, you can ask the, uh, the, the people from the ministry, what is it what you want to reach in this agreement? If you want to have an agreement, what is it what you want? And why is that important to you? Is it really something else? Would we be moving in the right direction? You would say, people, when they hesitate to tell, them, tell you their interest, these are the kind of questions you ask when you want to know their interest. And then it says, if you have only positions, the only thing you can do is give up on the position. Weaken, 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 weaken. If you know the interest, you can build on the interest and say, oh, if, if it is really about the future of your son, Mr. Farmer, it is about really the future of your, your son, and you really think that if we do this environmentally to, let's agriculture in this area, that there is no future for your son in the, in the, in the, in the farm, then maybe we should ask, what is what your son wants as a future? Maybe he doesn't want to be a farmer in these circumstances. Maybe we can help to get a good future for your son. Because if it is the interest is the future of your son, let's talk about the future of your son, and not about your present farm. And that's an opening. You understand? So in mutual gains, what you're doing is, is that you explore the interests on both sides. You go and say, I can tell you why I want this, what is why this is important to me. So maybe you can tell me yours, because then we might enlarge the pie. Maybe there's more to divide than we think. In the traditional method, you bring two people in a room, you give them a bottle of, with 100 euros. They know that they have to negotiate about dividing the euros. They know before, they come there, they go at the table, they sit at the table, and they start discussing how to divide these 100 euros. You come back after an hour and they sit back like this and you say, are you ready? They say, yes, we are ready. How much do you have? I have 25. How much do you have? I have 25. Now please tell me, there are still 50 in the pot. Yes, but we could not agree on this. Excuse me, we could not agree on this other 50. What's the problem? He wanted to have more of those 50 than I should have. And I don't, didn't think it was fair. So I denied. But listen, even if he would have more, let's say you have 15 and he had 35, those 50, then you would have 40 now instead of 25. Now explain to me, what is more, 25 or 40? And then he will say, that's not the point. The point is, it's not fair. You tell them, but weren't you asked to get as much as you could get? Yes, I was asked that. But they also told me, don't come back with less than 25. So 25, it's it, it is. I'm not happy, but this is it. Now what's wrong in this reasoning? There's 50 euros in the pot that go to nobody. They could have divided it. So how should that discussion have been going? How should it go? If somebody says, I need more of those 50, we agreed to, to, to split evenly the first 50, but now I need more, then I ask, it's possible that you need more. Please, can you explain why you think it is? Maybe you can also explain why you think it's fair. And he could say, you know, I represent over 100 people, and you represent five people. And I think that if we have to divide it, that it be that we have to, that it's fair that I have more to divide than you. I think that's fair. Or I have seven children and you have one. Or whatever it is. But please talk about the interest. Why you think that you should have more? And if you don't discuss it, you will never come to a solution. So the why question is the most important question. We always say the W word. So if we look at simulations, people do, do simulations, and we, are, we always we, we, we make notes of how often the question why is asked. And if you have a simulation, whenever the question why is asked, you have a poor result. You have the 25-25. And you confront the people with that. Say, this was in it, and this was in it, and this was in it. You, did you know? Did you know? Did you know? It was there. There was somebody at the table who could give you a million. You never asked. This price is very happy. Nobody asked, because they never asked. The money is still there. Understand? So, in the mutual gains approach, 
you explore these interests and you don't say, uh, you have, must have heard about the brainstorming rules, you don't say, oh no, oh no, oh no. You say, oh yeah, oh yeah, please explain a little more, a little more. And then invent without committing, which means, what if we would do it, I don't say I would give it to you, but what if we would uh, divide it 20-30? Uh, what if? I don't say that I agree with that, but uh, what if? Would it help you? That is inventing without commission. You say, I don't say that I give it, but I want to know, does it, does it help? That's the contingencies here. What if? And some people, you remember the orange trait things that people tell you differently? Somebody wants this, the other one wants that. Very often in uh, negotiations about environmental or sustainable development issues, for the NGOs, it's important that they can show to their constituency that they have reached a certain result. So, so you have to negotiate about how important is it for you that you can tell that it is your result. I've often sit in situations where the minister agreed on the condition that the press release would say that he had decided it. It was not true, but the other party said it's important for him for his political life. So give it to him. And it turned out that the minister was not so much interested in what is the content of the agreement, but just that he was the person who had solved the problem for his personal future. And if the other parties say it's not important for us, you give it to him because we are interested in content. And then the last one is that you, if you are in negotiations about sustainable development or, or um, uh, environmental issues that you, you come in a situation where you say no this is about the pie we can divide this is these are all the options on the table we can do this we can do this we can do this we can do this now we choose the one that we agree upon that is dividing the pie that is we try now to agree on uh, on what is what each of us will have then there's a risk that you come back into position so you must maintain this attitude of mutual gain so then it is very wise to decide, before you start this discussion, about what criteria shall we use. Do we have kind of objective criteria? Can we, can we uh, because sometimes it happens that somebody comes up with a criterion that was never on the table. In the end of the negotiation, suddenly somebody says, but you know, this is against this and this and this, and it was never on the table before. And if that is an important criterion, you should have it before. So find your criteria before, and then you can use these kind of criteria, the cost effectiveness, equal treatment, is it implementable, is there, and so on, and so on. So, to conclude, sustainable development is a way of embedding environmental concerns in the broad stream of decision making in politics, in, in big, big companies, and in society. Environment has its place, environmental concerns, environmental measures have their place in the context of sustainable development. There is no such way anymore that you can discuss environment as, as such. The major mistake in the negotiations at the moment about climate change is that they are occupied and taken by the environmentalists, which is very, very stupid. It should be discussed in the context of sustainable development. What happens if we really deal with this in the climate change issue? Can we afford it? Can we pay for it? What does it mean for the poor countries? And so on and so on. So sustainable development is, a op as I hope that I explained to you, is an operational way of thinking about what can be done for nature conservation, what can be done for the environment in the context of economic development and social development. Find its place. Second, be absolutely sure that you should be a very good negotiator in, if you take part in those processes. Because the process is a negotiation process, whatever people tell you about it. Sustainable development is not about science. Sustainable development is about the use of science in negotiation. It's people who most of the time don't know exactly how the situation is, who don't know the, the science, who do the negotiation. Always think about that. The third is, if you negotiate, you have skilled yourself, make sure that you apply a method that
that has been proven over the last 30 to 40 years to be a valuable asset, a valuable way of thinking about finding optimum. Because sustainable development, through the years, finding a development that is sustainable, that's good for you and for your children and grandchildren, and for the grandchildren of the people in Nicaragua and Ghana, is looking, finding all the time, in time, find an optimum. Not a compromise, optimum. Don't give up, but add. That's what sustainable development is about. And I've tried this morning to explain you a little bit about it. Thank you for your participation. <laughs>